Hello, my darlings, and welcome to a new episode of After Dark Fairy Tales. I have a new tale for you guys, and the title of this one is called Vacation to Kill For. Uh, now, this story was written by Daniel Hayes. If that name sounds familiar to you, uh, Daniel wrote Hothead and Hothead 2, and I just narrated one of his stories recently called Twisted. Um, so Daniel wanted me to check out this recent story, and he wanted to know what I thought about it. And I read it and liked it, and I thought it was crazy. So I'm going to share it with you all, and you guys let me know what you think about it. Like I said, it's insane, and the title is called Vacation to Kill For. So, like I said, it's a wild ride, so <laughs> you guys let me know. Um, to all my new subscribers, I'd like to say welcome to After Dark Fairy Tales. Thank you for being here and being a part of the After Dark family. And uh, all of you who have already been here, I'd like to say thank you for your comments and your likes. They're real encouraging. And uh, I'm glad you guys like my narration, but most importantly, the stories that I try to bring to life through uh, verbal form and also showcase the talent from other authors as well. So I'm glad you guys are here. And enough blabbing. I'm going to get right into this one. And you all let me know what you think about it. Like I said, it's wild. So here we go. Vacation to Kill For by Daniel Hayes. The Pinewood Apartment Complex, located on 5th Street in downtown Weiselberg, Virginia, is a community all on its own, with nosy neighbors, loud mouthed kids, and regular decent people. Just trying to get by, the pine wood is a living, breathing organism. The high rise building has 25 floors with 15 apartments on each level. The first six floors are reserved for small families because they have more bedrooms. Married couples and single people live above the sixth floor, and the layout for each apartment is relatively the same. The apartments have everything a person could want except for space. The most important factor at the Pinewood, and the one thing everyone could agree on, was the affordability. This attracted many poor and middle class people with different ethnic backgrounds and cultures to live there. In fact, there were no vacancies unless one of the older residents died or some college kid moved out. Privacy is a big concern at the Pinewood, if Mrs. Dingle's dog took a dump in the wrong place, everyone knew about it. Secrets were even harder to keep, and if the rumor club talks about it, then it's the gospel truth. In fact, police have responded to so many false calls, they don't give the place a second thought. Acceptance is the golden rule, and if you're willing to abide by the terms of the unwritten contract, then you can learn to live with it. In apartment 23C, Jim Sterling was cooking a nice romantic dinner for his wife, Claire. He was wearing his favorite apron that said, I love the cook, which complimented his big black sweatpants and gray short sleeve shirt. Today was their one year wedding anniversary and he wanted everything to be perfect when she got home from work. Claire's schedule was like clockwork. She always got home at 4 p.m., but today she was running late. I wonder where she is, he thought to himself. The oven beat and Jim took out the lasagna and placed it on the kitchen table that was all decked out with flowers and candles. He thought that this was a nice touch because he always made it from scratch and Claire loved it. Everything looked perfect. It was now 20 past four and Jim was starting to worry. He grabbed his phone and dialed Claire's number. At that moment, Claire burst through the door with the biggest smile he had ever seen in his life. With her blue pantsuit and long black hair, she was still the most beautiful woman he had ever seen in his life. Honey, are you all right? You're late, Jim said. Claire threw her arms around Jim and said, I'm fine, sweetie. 
I have wonderful news. Jim squeezed her tight in a loving embrace and asked, What is it? What's going on? I won. I hit the jackpot this time, she said. Jim's eyes got bigger as he released her and asked, You won the lottery? No, don't be crazy. I want something much better than that, she said. Jim looked puzzled and asked, What is it? Tell me. Today at work, they had a sweepstakes drawing for an all-expense-paid vacation to to YY Land. And I won, she said. Jim smiled and asked, You mean that famous tropical island that's supposed to be the greatest place on earth? Yes, the same one. It's a once-in-a-lifetime trip, and I won. Can you believe it? The plane leaves in the morning, she said. Jim pointed to the kitchen table and said, Well, I guess we better eat and start packing then. This will be the best anniversary ever. Claire looked at the table and saw the candles burning brightly next to a beautiful bouquet of roses and a hot steamy pan of lasagna. In all the excitement, she had totally forgotten about their wedding anniversary. For a brief moment, she felt sad and then quickly remembered about the vacation. She had a simple truth to tell Jim, and she decided to get right to the point. Jim, this trip is for one person only, she said. Jim's smile quickly faded. He raised his hand and brushed it through his black hair. He only did this when he was nervous or anxious. He looked at Claire and said, One person? I wonder if I can call the airline and buy another ticket. Claire squeezed her lips into a thin line and shook her head, saying no. Jim, there is no way we can afford that. I don't think we have $60,000 in the bank. She pointed her finger at Jim and gave him a fierce look of determination, sprinkled with a little dash of anger. I'm going on this trip alone. You are not going to ruin this for me. Jim's eyes darted back and forth, and he put his index finger to his puckered lips and spoke in a whisper. Shh, you have to be quiet. You don't want everyone in the entire building to hear us arguing, do you? Besides, I should be the one going. I look at this wonderful dinner I made for you. Claire shouted even louder. Let's be honest, Jim. Your lasagna sh sucks. You don't mean that, do you, Claire? Oh, yes, I do. Everyone knows your lasagna sucks. I just pretend to like it so I, I won't hurt your feelings. Jim squeezed his hands into a fist and said, You little witch. Give me that ticket. I deserve to go on that trip more than you do. Claire reached in her pocket and pulled out a white envelope that contained the entire vacation package and waved it in front of Jim's face. Is this what you want, Jim? The only way you're going to get this is to pry it from my dead hands. That can be arranged, he said. He grabbed a big cutting knife from the table and marched towards Claire with murderous intent in his eyes. Claire quickly stepped back into the living room and Jim tripped on the carpet. The knife slid under the coffee table and Jim stretched his arm out to reach for it. Claire ran back into the kitchen and put on her oven mittens. She grabbed a big pan of lasagna from the table and walked back over to Jim. He was still trying to grab the knife that was just out of reach. He looked up at her as she kicked him across the face. The impact was so hard he rolled over on his back. Claire raised the hot lasagna pan up high above her head and slammed it down on his face. Jim screamed in agony as the lasagna burned through his skin like hot coals from a furnace. He rolled around on the floor like his entire body was on fire. Claire picked up the knife from under the table and watched as Jim suffered in pain. She decided to grant him some mercy. I think we're finished, Jim. Claire threw the knife down hard in one swift motion. It punctured through his head like a hot knife would cut through butter. Jim's suffering was over. He was dead. Just then, a loud pounding came from the door. Claire stepped over Jim's dead body 
and quickly answered the door. She was greeted by Mrs. Dingle, who was wearing a beautiful blue floral dress, complete with a big matching handbag draped over her arm. Her white hair was held back with a blue headband that complemented her thick black glasses. Hi, Mrs. Dingle. What brings you by? Claire asked. You know why I'm here, dear, she said, pushing her way through the door. Mrs. Dingle found Jim's body lying in a pool of blood in the living room. Oh, my, she said. Claire ran over to her and said, I can explain everything. Mrs. Dingle interrupted her. There's no need to explain anything, dear. I know what's going on here. I heard the whole argument from next door. She pointed to the wall and continued, Don't you know these walls are paper thin? Claire's eyes widened in shock. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to disturb you. You're not going to call the cops, are you? As Claire awaited her reply, she scanned the room looking for a suitable weapon to kill her with. After a few moments, Mrs. Dingle said, Call the cops? Why would I ever do that? I've known you kids ever since you moved in here. She smiled and started to unzip her handbag. Claire asked, What are you doing? Oh, don't worry, my dear. I have something here in my bag that will make all of this go away, she said. She reached down in her bag and pulled out a 12-inch black skillet. Now, don't you worry. This won't take long. Claire stepped back towards the door and said, What the hell are you doing? Mrs. Dingle strode towards Claire and slammed the skillet down across her head. Claire fell down on the floor and Mrs. Dingle said, If anyone is going to Tawaiwai land, it's going to be me. Claire was seen double as Mrs. Dingle stood above her prone body. She brought the skillet down like a hammer multiple times to finish the job. Blood splattered against the walls with each deadly hit. With Claire now dead, Mrs. Dingle reached down into Claire's pocket and removed the white envelope. Mrs. Dingle woke up early the next morning because she had a plane to catch. She packed her little green suitcase the night before and left explicit instructions for Mr. Dingle to watch her dog, Teddy Bear. She left her apartment and walked towards the elevator where she saw Bobby grabbing a soda from the nearby vending machine. Bobby looked at Mrs. Dingle carrying the little suitcase and said, You off to somewhere, Mrs. Dingle? As a matter of fact, I am, Bobby. I'm going to Tawaiwai land, she said. Bobby nodded his head and said, People say that place is amazing. You can have anything you want there. I know, Bobby, dear. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have a flight to catch, she said. Bobby ran ahead of Mrs. Dingle and blocked the elevators. Uh, the elevators are down again for maintenance. You better take the stairs, she said. Mrs. Dingle looked over at the stairs with apprehension and said, I don't like those stairs. At my age, I hope I can make it down in time. Bobby grabbed her hand and said, Don't worry, Mrs. Dingle. I'll help you. Oh, what a nice young man you are. Thank you very much, she said. They walked together, hand in hand, over to the staircase. Bobby said, Watch that first step, Grandma. He grabbed her arm with both hands and threw her down the stairs. He cringed as the sounds of broken bones echoed throughout the stairwell and a final thud. Mrs. Dingle hit the bottom of the staircase with a broken neck and was dead. Bobby ran down the stairs and frantically searched through her handbag. He found what he was looking for and pulled out the white envelope that contained the vacation package. He looked around to see if anyone was watching. He didn't see anyone and felt good at what he had done. I'm sorry, Mrs. Dingle. I think you forgot I live next door from you and the Sterlings. I heard everything that happened. To why by land, here I come. Bobby ran down the rest of the stairs and stormed out the apartment complex. 
He hailed the first cab he saw and got in. The cab driver looked him over and asked, Where to, buddy? Bobby smiled and held up the envelope. Take me to the airport. My tropical island paradise awaits. So, did you guys like that one? Yeah, was that crazy or what? I want to give all credit to Daniel Hayes. I'm glad he shared this one with me. And I'm glad I was able to share it with you all. So, y'all let me know what y'all thought about it. Like I said, I thought it was crazy. <laughs> really wild. But uh, it's very good. I thought it was good. But that's just my opinion. I want to know what y'all thought. So, But I, I like to give all credit once again to Daniel Hayes. And please check out his other stories as well. Like Hothead and Hothead 2. I also put the link to his um, Ritzy page. Because the story is published on Ritzy. You can check out his other stories on his Ritzy page as well. And uh, if you go to my videos, you'll see Hothead, Hothead, Hothead 2, and also Twisted. So, I hope you guys like that one. And uh, you guys can let me know. And like I said, I hope I'm bringing some good entertainment to you guys. I'm glad that you guys are enjoying the stories. I know not all of you are going to like, you know, every story I narrate, but... Try to find some good ones. And then Daniel shared that one with me. And I was like, okay, I'm going to read this insane story to you guys. <laughs> but uh, you guys let me know what you think. And once again, I want to thank all you guys for your support and being here and being part of After Dark Fairy Tales. And I'll be back next time with some other creepy tales for you. I'll try to find, you know, some more authors to send me in some more creepy, scary you know, spine tingling things for you guys. So, and so, like I said, I'll be back again and check out the rest of Daniel Say's work. And until next time, good night, my darlings. <laughs>